Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is EE380 at Stanford uh, with uh, Ted Nelson, a friend of 50 years almost, um, from uh, the great state of New Jersey. Um, he has the same decorative uh, taste that I do with the cardboard boxes across the back of the room and uh, lots of information. Uh, Ted is a, a um, well, I don't know what he is. He's not a computer scientist, but he is a philosopher of the mind, I think. He knows how people think, and he has for years fought for computer systems which support uh, how humans think. And uh, for that, we can all thank him. Uh, he's um, one of the greats. You can't say much more than that. Hi, I'm Ted Nelson. I always start that way. I'm honored to be here at Virtual Stanford, and my thanks to Dennis Allison for inviting me. I'll talk a while and then take questions. We'll have to quit at your 5 p.m. sharp. Okay, the standard story of my life, which you'll read in Wikipedia, is that I simply coined the word hypertext, one of various words I've coined. Hypertext, hypermedia, transclusion, dildonics, enfilade data structure. But I just remembered that I invented hypertext, which I had forgotten. Now, it is unseemly and suspicionable to be making this claim now, but you'll forgive the irregularity of an old man's memory. <laughs> this narrative involves a multi-year timeline, which I'll make clear as we go along. First item on the timeline. January 23rd, 1950, a cover of Time magazine, I was in eighth grade, which caricatured a computer, paren, the Mark III naval computer, wearing a naval officer's hat and eyeing a long tape. The caption was, can man build a Superman? I read the article and couldn't understand how computer processes went beyond numbers. Timeline jump to 1959 when I got out of college. When I graduated, my father offered me a career as a Hollywood actor, the whole nine yards, agent at SAG card and all. He was a director and could do that. And I now regret that I didn't take that offer. <laughs> but instead, when I popped out of Swarthmore in 1959, I thought myself all too clever, able to see farther and faster than most. And I hoped to find or found some new field that hadn't been invented yet. So I went to graduate school to find out what I'd missed as an undergraduate. Timeline jumped to 1960. At Harvard in the fall of 1960, I took a computer course. I had wanted to know what the hell a computer was since that baffling cover of Time magazine in 1950. I was astounded. They had been lying. Computers were not mathematical. They were all purpose machines. They could hold text and you could put screens on them, interactive screens. That was clear in the brochures from Digital Equipment Corporation. Interactive screens. I was a movie maker. I could see at once what that meant. I predicted in 1960 that the interactive screen would be the new home of the human race. Was I wrong? Uh, but there were only a few interactive screens in the country, and I'd never seen one. But I started collecting the brochures on interactive graphic machines from digital equipment. They didn't claim to be selling computers. They called them program data processors or PDPs. And I believe I told people in 1960, the interactive screen will be the new home of the human race. Was I wrong? But nobody could understand what I was talking about. This, I thought, was my sword in the stone, my door to greatness. I was going to be the CEO and figurehead of the personal computer revolution. I would found the field of personal computing with a company called General Creative Inc., of which I would be CEO and figurehead. In fact, I basically inv invented the concept of Apple and Steve Jobs. But it was too early. The real Steve Jobs was only five years old, and I never found my Wozniak. Still, I plunged ahead in 1960 with my plan for great general creative. I would open a word processing coffee house right away in Harvard Square. My 1960 sketch for that coffee house is on the Internet Archive on the Ted Nelson upload page, as well as other notes from 1960 for general creative. 
My coffee house pitch must have been great. A fellow grad student named Graham Gibbard was going to invest $10,000. But thank God I didn't take his money or go any further. I see that somebody named Graham Gibbard co-authored two book books on group sociology. That's all I can find out. But I guess it was the same guy. So much for 1960. Then stuff happened. I got married, taught sociology at Vassar. Timeline jumped to 1965. My courses are under control and I publish a lot of articles about hypertext, about movie editing by computer, about what would later be called CGI. I was trying to develop a CGI system I called Phantasm, along with a lot of other designs, too many other designs. So in 1965, I published papers on Phantasm, on movie editing by computer, and on hypertext. My biggest hit in 1965 was my paper on hypertext for the ACM National Conference. I believe that most of the computer scientists in the world may have been there. It was still possible at that time. And my final slide said, change, 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 exclamation point. The, the applause was thunderous. Afterward, Bob Taylor came up to me and asked if I'd heard of Douglas Engelbart in California who did text systems. I resolved to meet this fellow. Bob Taylor was at that time Doug Engelbart's financial sponsor at DARPA, which was at the time called Defense Advanced Research Projects <clears throat> of America or something. Timeline jumped to next year, 1966, and I'm assistant to the president of Harcourt Brace and World, Wild Bill Yovanovitch himself. I'm trying, it's a publishing company, a notable publishing company. I'm assistant to what I'm uh, reporting to Wild Bill Yovanovitch himself. I'm trying to get him to buy a PDP graphics machine. He budgeted at $50,000 for the year. And in that fateful 1966, Wild Bill Yovanovitch and I fly, fly out together to California. <clears throat> Yovanovitch's company, Harcourt, sells text textbooks. So Yovanovitch wants to meet with Richard Atkinson. Yes, at Stanford. He's a big name in program instruction. In the meeting, I tried to tell Richard Atkinson about hypertext. He bellows, or so I recall, we don't know how to do that yet. Thinking I meant computer meant computer assisted instruction where the student has a conversation with the computer. From his inability to hear me, I thought Richard Atkinson was the most pig headed individual I had ever met. Some years later, I noted with interest that Richard Atkinson had become president of the entire University of California. Perhaps big headedness is what it takes. Anyway, because of the trip with Wild Bill Yovanovitch, there I was in California in 66, so I went to see Engelbart. And he was the nicest possible guy. I got the whole demo from him. The legendary great demo he gave two years later to an audience in California, you can watch it online. It's called The Mother of All Demos. It's an hour, and, and he begins by being very modest and saying he's going to talk through the microphone and you're going to see stuff on the screen. And he types with one hand and uses the mouse with the other. His name Engelbart was Norwegian. I later mentioned the name to my grandfather. My grandfather said, oh, yes, Engelbart, angel's beard. Apparently, Norwegian angels have beards. So Engelbart showed me his hypertext jump. But like all his functions, it required a keyboard input. You had to memorize keyboard instructions. So it wasn't what I thought of as a smooth functioning literary medium. You had to learn commands. So here is the simple command list for Engelbart's system with about 20 commands. It was two-sided in the original. It's on the Internet Archive. 20 commands on each page that you had to learn. <clears throat> Timeline jumped to the next year, 1967. That was the Expo 67 in Montreal. I went to see the movies. They had a 360 degree movie, <coughs> a vertical screen, <coughs> a 360 uh, movie that you ducked under to be fully surrounded by 360 degrees of movie a vertical screen with a horizontal screen, and, and a movie with a choose your own ending. I couldn't get in, but I talked to the producer, Radu Shinshara, who explained to me that it was not a great carpet of choices as it seemed to be, 
but always a two-way choice leading to what would turn out to be the next two-way choice. So it was very trickily constructed to have only pairwise jumps that were always the same on the next one. Okay, timeline jump to next year, 1968. I had been fired by Wild Bill Yovanovich. The IBM salesman had won, keeping rival equipment out of Harcourt and getting rid of me as well. That's about when my former friend Van Dam came to our host house in Poughkeepsie and invited me oh so warmly to come to Brown and to, quote, try out your crazy ideas, unquote. Now, Van Damme and I had been macho acquaintances at Swarthmore. While most people played Frisbee with plastic discs, about 11 inch discs, Frisbee had just arrived in spring of 57, I think. And so it was a year and a half later that I graduated. Somehow I'd gotten hold my senior year of steel beer trays, about 18 inches in diameter, and Van Damme and I would hurl and chase them at great distances of hundreds of yards. That was the extent of our friendship, but it was cordial. So, I started to commute to Brown, and for two years drove back and forth at my own expense, burning up my savings of, I think, $2,100, thinking I would get some reward or thanks, where the, the, but there had been no negotiation, let that be a lesson. So for two years, I commuted to Brown in 1968 to nine, creating the HES system, S. I rented cars for the purpose, and I rented a room in the graduate dormitory. Van Damme was certainly no longer a friend. His cordiality turned to venom. He treated me with incredible insult and scorn, the same way he treated his lowest rank assistants or, quote, schleps. I was cordial to him, but he did not return it. I invited him to dinner, no response. I have conjectured that this nasty streak was acquired in his boyhood, which I've heard was in a Japanese prison camp in the Dutch East Indies, but I can't confirm that. So I was hardworking, driving back and forth, unpaid, constantly insulted, and never thanked with even a letter. I later asked the ACM for an ethics hearing on my treatment at Brown, but by then the matter was much too far in the past. Okay, so my work at Brown in 1968 and 1969. Van Damme had the expensive, the super expensive graphic system from IBM, millions of dollars worth, unlike the low price screens from digital equipment. I worked with the main programmer, Stephen Carmody, Carmody and I implemented the highlighted span of text, which when clicked, clicked, caused a jump to another page. I'll repeat that. Here's some text on the screen. A certain part is differentiated, so it looks different and invites you to click on it. I called it a link. An author could highlight a portion of text and a reader could click on it, whereupon another page would replace it. That worked fine. Not to be upstaged by my link, Van Damme created the quote branch, a multiple choice point. That has not survived. In this project, I also invented the back button. I think it was Carmody who said, quote, users will never understand that. I said, trust me. People have asked me which back buttons I invented. All of them, I say, believing they derive from the one in Hess. Okay, confirmation. I believe this whole story can be confirmed by the distinguished San Francisco attorney, Terry Gross, who as an undergraduate was part of the team <clears throat> graduated with a, math, with a major in computer science. So that is the story. I implemented the link as we now know it. And who gets the credit? Why, of course, Tim Berners-Lee. <laughs> Timeline jumped to whenever. Tim is a great guy. I've argued with him at length in his home in Massachusetts. I gave his wife my Art Deco wristwatch when she admired it. Some other timeline jump, Tim and I also argued in a bar in Tokyo. Timeline jump to maybe 2019 in San Francisco at the Internet Archive. I told Tim that his main achievement, as I see it, was to unify all the different servers on the Internet with a consistent addressing scheme, the URL, despite their different operating systems which is why a space is represented by percent 20. You don't ask me more about that. The rest would have happened if you once given the URL, hypertext would have happened. And he agreed with me. So I will stop there and take questions. In any case, uh, when you're meeting with Engelbart, did you have any, uh, uh, any I guess, insight? I can't see who's speaking, by the way. Who's speaking? Dennis. I'm up here. Oh, it says you're muted, but apparently you're not. 
apparently not. Uh, in any case, um, in your um, in your meeting with Engelbart, did you learn anything that was uh, really surprising for you? No. Much of it was as I had imagined. Of course, I was immediately converted to the mouse. But the uh, the the keyboard that you'd have to learn, well, uh, that that was that was a that was definitely a, a thresh a, a hard threshold, and the many commands that were required mm -hmm. were, were, were a considerable problem. Mm -hmm. So, I, I showed you the I showed you the small command structure. Now here's here's here is the big one. The quick reference <laughs> with about 70 commands on this page and 70 commands on that page. So Engelbart, you see, had this interesting way of putting it. He said, it's easy to learn to ride a tricycle, but you can't get, it far in it, get very far in it. Whereas it's harder to learn to, a bicycle, to ride a bicycle, but you can get much farther on a bicycle. Mm -hmm. However, learning 170 commands or whatever the number you want to say, was not like learning to ride a bicycle, because once you learn to ride a bicycle, it's easy. It's got its own swoop. But those, seven, those many, many commands didn't have a swoop. You had to memorize them. Mm -hmm. But he imagined that this was a threshold people could be expected to navigate. And, and, and this, this was his fundamental misunderstanding. Did you try to use the paddles and the foot paddles as well? Paddles. Yes, so he had a handset which had the eight, eight buttons on it, but it was a cord keyboard. And you could write various things into the cord keyboard. I didn't see that. Yeah, and also there was a foot one as well, but it was less, uh, less, less uh, elegant. I actually have a, 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 an Engelbart key, key set with the five paddles and the, uh, it's been, Adapted with a with a USB uh, interface, so if I want if I ever want to start learning to use it, that'd be great. Although I think it only types capital letter. <laughs> right. So out there, is there anybody else who has questions, or am I the only interested person here? Okay, there are a couple questions in chat. Um, I'll read them. Do you have any ideas for a user interface for bidirectional hyperlinks other than a list of links to the page? In particular, there are some good options for making bidirectional links visible in a work written by a single person. The moderator can read this question. Well, talking about interfaces is just talk without a whiteboard and without so the answer is yeah sure <laughs> but we're not but but it, it's there there are many possibilities depends on what what sorts of gimmicks you're using are you using a mouse are you using a trackpad but uh and, and how, how it would appear there, there are many possibilities but i wouldn't i wouldn't go into them in a conversation uh one of the other attendees says what would you have preferred be done differently to how the W3C implemented Hyperdex. W3C did not implement it. Tim implemented it. From then on, it was this juggernaut that he's writing. So <clears throat> uh, once, once you have that juggernaut in place, all you can do is add to the mess that is HTML. And so, and, 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 uh, and I hate it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, some years ago you worked, well, you worked for a long time on the Xanadu system, which is a different approach to, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, representation of hypertext. Is this work that continues? Xanadu has had many, many incarnations as I, I tried to leap from possibility to possibility. Uh, I'm not actively working on it now. The version we programmed in 1969 with the Dream Team was absolutely fabulous. 
And if I hadn't screwed up in 1988, and when Mark complained, I demoted Roger. And instead of trying to finish what Roger had done, Mark tried to rebuild it completely differently. And after four years, Autodesk cut him off. So if I hadn't demoted Roger on Mark's complaint, it would have been finished within the, in fact, time horizon Roger had predicted, and we would have had our own version. Not to say it would have been the only system, but it would have been a demonstration. It would have been one system of indexing all kinds of pieces, of creating virtual documents with visible links and transclusions, and assigning a universal address to every character. Uh, good to see you, Ted, a uh, long time ago. But uh, I would like to ask, <laughs> I know, uh, uh, I would like to ask you if the screen is the limit for um, the hypertext. Now I'm working in, in outer space. What kind of technologies you you imagine we can use in outer space? I mean, I'm working with the space agencies. What, what, what do you think we can envision on on new technologies, on new interfaces, on, I mean, if the, the, the space is the limit, I mean, the, the, the sky is the limit, and, and the screen is the limit, I mean, what metaphor can, can you envision for these new technologies that can be developed on these new environments and boundless? Right? What new technologies? I'm asking if you imagine one. I mean, no, I mean, a screen, is a, a screen is a fundamental concept and it's not going to change. We may have better screens, we may have better ways of flipping amongst them and, and new styles of, of, uh, of uh, interaction, but two dimensions will be with us forever. Of course, we'll have the three dimensional headsets too, but uh, you can't always get that. <laughs> you, can't, you can't count on having having walking around with your head in a three dimensional gadget. Nice, good to hear. Good to hear you. What did you do after senior university? Uh, uh, I, I I lost your track there. You were teaching at the uh, government uh, school or something like that. You're yeah. asking about sixty years of what I did. Well, no, forty years of what I did. I did a lot of different things. I taught a number of different places. All right. Published many articles. Excellent. Well, thank you, Ted. Good to see you. Gracias. <laughs> wow, this is a real hot group here. Really lively. <laughs> I think I think it's the the technology is for many people still a bit of an intimidation. Um, So could could you summarize kind of the advances over Engelbart's uh, system that uh, you made here? Advances I made over Engelbart's system. Oh, that that, that your that, yeah that you that you made your system made over Engelbart's system. Engelbart had a cosmic system that did one hundred and fifty things. Okay. Xanadu has always dealt with connected documents. So that's one small part of the 100, that's, that's two out of 150 th things that Engelbart system did. And we had our own way of doing it, our own internals. And I, again, I'm referring to the canonical system of 1969 with the dream team. Yeah. Uh, uh, we had our own internals, our own addressing, our own universal addressing scheme, which was going to unite all the servers in the same way, not the same way, but much just as Tim Berners-Lee united all the servers with the URL, we were, let, we were going to unite all the servers with a comparable addressing scheme. Hi, I have a question. Speaking as a hard hardware engineer, uh, 
What was it like running and developing all of this on vintage 1969 hardware? We weren't running it on 1969 hardware. We were designing it on blackboards. Oh, I see. We then obtained probably the first Unix system that was available to the public. I forget who the manufacturer was. And, 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 and Roger worked hard translating that code. He called it XU88. Now remember, we designed this in 99. We called it XU88 because he figured it would take until 1988 to get it working. And he worked on it all those years. And in 1988, if I hadn't <clears throat> Demoted Mark when Roger what demoted Roger when Mark complained, we would have had it running. And what year did you get the first Unix system? Whenever it was available. Uh, something like nineteen seventy two, I'm not sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. The Unix systems were, were available to nonprofits. We were not a nonprofit, so we had to buy one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, anyways, it was assumed that the nonprofit had its own hardware, <laughs> but then they could get they, they would get the, uh, the Unix would be free. Mm -hmm. Somewhere somewhere in this uh, household or in this complex of buildings, I have a brochure called the Unix programming, the Unix programmers console, an introduction. And I believe it was the first write up that what's his name and what's his name who created Unix said they called it a programmers console, not a time sharing system. It had followed Multics, you see, and Multics tried to put all the different functions into different programs. Whereas Unix had this had the much more straightforward notion of a fundamental kernel and then individual, whatchamacallits, uh, that are that are then called by this kernel to do particular things with particular arguments. So I have a question, Ted. Oh, yeah. uh, about Hi, I know you. Hi. Yes. <laughs> uh, I have to point out that your book, Computer Lib and Dream Machines depending on which way it was turned, was one of the most influential books in my life. <laughs> about comparable to the whole Earth catalog for computing. And I really think you should revive that book uh, it, it, if it's not currently. It is available uh, now. Oh, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go to nelswag.com. You okay. can get them either shrink-wrapped in a recent printing, or if you're, if you're some kind of a uh, fetishist, you can get original first first editions for like much more. I think I think the shrink wrap costs a hundred dollars now, and the and the the uh, the first editions are more. I don't run that. I still have one, of course. <laughs> right, but uh, anyway, nelswag.com is is selling various stuff of mine. I get a cut. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Yeah, the the uh, the thing that the most amazing stuff that you produced over the years. In any case, what you did is you did a bunch of uh, of books that were inspiring about how things ought to work and how they ought to look and how they ought to do. Um, the computer science side of it was hard because we had never done it before, and a lot of times. What you wanted was not known. We didn't know how to do it. But over time, we've gotten closer, but we're still a long way from that because you move ball well forward every time you have the opportunity. But it's it's interesting. As I said, you weren't a computer scientist. You who, are, says, I wasn't, who says I wasn't a computer scientist? I, I would say that. You're not a computer scientist. You're a step above a computer scientist. Computer scientists work with the little parts of the computer. You actually work with the way people use them and think. I also did a lot of internal design, 
many different versions of Xanadu in terms of uh, data structures and so on. Oh, I understand that. No, so if, if that's not computer science, then what is? That is computer science. But the thing that has always impressed me about the, your work has been that you articulated goals that would, were not obviously goals, and you got people to think about what they were doing and how it worked and what the relationships of things were in ways that the normal computer scientists never did. And it was, uh, it was a, a big thing for you, I think. And yeah. It was certainly well, a big uh, thing for a lot of us. And, you know, I think, I think, you know, you're, it puts you in the, in the forefront of the computers, computer people from the, uh, from the, from the, you know, 60s on. And, you know, it's just a lot of people are really, I think, unaware of how influential and significant the work you've been done has been. And so go read the books, start out with computer lib and, or one of the others. And but computer lib is the book that, that inspired so many people. When I was running the people's computer company and computer lib came out, it was for us a bestseller for quite a long time. And um, we had to deal with the fact that it was self-published and, you know, the, um, the supply chain was not necessarily great, but it. Um, yeah, I was screwed was, by my distributors, but huh? yeah. I was screwed by my distributors. Sold fifty thousand copies didn't say CSM. Yeah, well, it's nonetheless you inspired a generation of, of people who learned about computers and then built things with them. What was most in, what is most interesting retroactively about computer lib, I think, is the number of different areas and specialties that I mentioned, which were surprising to people in other specialties. Mm -hmm. So, so it was a it was a panoramic view of a whole lot of stuff that wasn't available anywhere else. That's right, and it. It was in the same general stylistic category as the whole Earth catalog and a whole bunch of other documents of the time, which basically laid out technology in people's uh, kitchen table and they got to pick what they wanted to play with and what they didn't. And uh, they were heady times. And, you know, it <clears throat> it still strikes me as being very strange that at PCC we were able to sell computer time to fifth graders at 25 cents an hour on a basic shared system. <laughs> basic. Mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a little uh, work area that was uh, uh, filled with uh, books and papers and games to play and that sort of thing. Uh, but those people went on to become the uh, systems programmers of our time. And, you know, the secret in some sense to the, uh, to the Silicon Valley was that we had a whole bunch of people who learned about computers and got th thinking about things very early in their lives, pre, pre high school. Pretty nice. Okay. Hi, Ted. Um, so I'm from the strategy field and uh, I wanted to ask your, your view. Wait, the on strategy that. field, what is that? Uh, it's from the business school, strategic management. Ah, because I, I took strategy under Tom Schelling at Harvard. You don't get any right. yeah, more That's what I mentioned. I, I wanted to ask you about your, your view of the kind of, uh, in terms of implementing Xanadu and so forth, uh, what do you think about the current technology landscape, in particular, like a, a, a small number of very large technology platforms seem to be dominating uh, certainly in the business side and actually, you know, a lot of the conversation that's going on even in the universities. Uh, so how would you go about, who would you work with? Who would you collaborate? Uh, how would you go about implementing Xanadu now when you have these technology platforms? Well, okay. Let, let's, let's, let's talk about what Xanadu was in the, in the XU88 version. <clears throat> the notion of transclusion was particularly subtle. The idea being that you could 
bring in dynamically any part of any other document. An author could require payment. Now, people have accused me of wanting to charge for everything. Not at all. I wanted to make it possible for people to charge. So if you brought in something <clears throat> that there was no charge for, it appeared immediately. If you transcluded something which required payment, this would become evident in the, let's call it the browser of the user, and the payment would have to be made in order for that portion which was transcluded, transcluded to come in. So this, had, this was a way, and Jeremy Lanier has praised it, of handling A, mashups, B, the, the payment issue, which everyone said, oh, that doesn't matter. And of course, came to matter very much later on. So it was an early solution. It is an early and elegant, though now impossible, solution to a spectrum of issues. The mashup, copyright, and Payment, my micropayment. So beyond the kind of micropayments issue, it's just the kind of the way that we, the large companies are kind of storing data um, seems very different from what you had in mind. Yeah, everything's different. <laughs> what can yeah. I say? Yeah. So okay. So how would you navigate that kind of? I give up. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's just a, it's just an environment that has to be lived in now. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to build anything. So, Ted, how do you feel about the, the uh, sort of aggressive capture of every piece of data you can possibly get your hands on by Various organizations. Who is speaking now? Dennis. Oh, okay. Because you're, your 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 square isn't blinking or anything. Yeah. I, I, the thing is that I'm host as well, and Zoom treats hosts specially. Hmm. But in any case, what do you think of the, of the of the surveillance capitalism society that we've created? Uh, is this? Uh, it's certainly not the the something you created with your model of how the world works but it certainly has model of warlords of what how the world works oh, oh, but. but it has certainly had an impact on uh on uh on our society and how we how things get dealt with um is you're, you're what am i supposed to say there it is yeah yeah, no, I'm just wondering whether you had any thoughts as to what we might do. No, just try to survive in this mess. <laughs> I think, okay, other questions, folks? Uh, I'll jump in for a second. Hi, Ted. Hello. Nice to see you. Have, have we met? We've met uh, a number of times okay. over the years. Um, I think the last time that we saw each other was uh, in the Gate Five parking lot. Mm. Uh, so, uh, and and then there was a. I think when we first met, I had lent you a a, a U-Matic video uh, machine for one of your demos or something. Yeah, anyway, right. we 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 met like in '88 or '89 or something. Oh. I met Roger in Palo Alto, and you know saw you at Autodesk a number of times, and. Um, so I, I, why well, I, I think to this question or, you know, this, this, uh, this issue of the surveillance state, you, you devised a, this is maybe more of a commentary than a question. We'll find a question maybe, but you had a very uh, democratized uh, model that was very of the time. And that was, um, and, 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 and you're right. I mean, it's just been co-opted. It's just, that's so not, where the world is right now, but the 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 quality of foreshadowing that you brought, I'm just sort of ganging up with Dennis's comments. I see you as the direct descendant of Vannevar Bush. You you're really the second in line uh, uh, to that 
Oh, yeah. I called him up in Cal in in the in the Cambridge once, and I, I said I was interested in working on his ideas, but but he sounded like an athletic coach, so that turned me off, and I didn't call him again. Yeah, perhaps so. <laughs> no, nonetheless, uh, intellectually, conceptually, you're you're of that lineage, right. and I very much see that the that the transclusion mechanism it was really a a, a log of links. Uh, and and sort of no. Uh, the mechanism was was not of links. It was of portions to be brought in dynamically. But those portions were the history of those portions were captured. Yes. The ownership of the portions were captured, not necessarily history. I see. Okay. Well, because I was uh, I I was going to make a leap that there was some sort of self-contained. Uh, history of the linkage and in, in that is a, a kind of a foreshadowing of this whole blockchain widget that people are so excited about now but that's maybe my a bridge in my mind no one no one else's anyway nice to see you when i saw dennis's invitation uh, uh for your uh for your presentation today it's like i gotta say hello to ted so nice to see you i hope you're well Dennis said I was going to say some things about Engelbart. I have a few remarks prepared. First of all, um, the, uh, the first thing I want to say is that after this is over, please call up Ted Nelson's eulogy for Doug Engelbart, because I worked very hard on that and, 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 uh, and, uh, It tells all too truly what was important about Doug's life and work and how, how betrayed he felt and how much of his work. So I guess that's, that's about, I, there's so much to say about Doug. We had many, many hours of conversation and they're all, they're all on tape and he has, he gave his permission for them all to be published, so that could happen sometime, maybe. But he was a very, very dear individual. His, uh, his daughters thought he had Alzheimer's, whereas, in fact, I think it was just chemo brain. He'd, he'd had cancer and, and had, uh, had had chemotherapy, so his, his memory was very poor. But aside from that, his personality was as angelic always possible. When it looked like we were going to lose him, Marlene finally agreed to marry me so that he could perform the ceremony. So uh, if you look on YouTube, uh, the wedding ceremony where Marlene and I get married as, as, as officiated by, by Doug Engelbart and his wife, Karen, and, and uh, <laughs> Doug had an interesting anecdote, which was that Doug told me that he was hired by, uh, by Hewlett, at Hewlett Packard, personally hired by Hewlett. And, uh, and he said, uh, oh, but I want to work with computers. And Hewlett said, oh, I'm sorry. Hewlett Packard will never have anything to do with computers. Okay. That was then. Ted? Yes. Hi. I can step in for a second. The All American um, Boy. The All American Boy. Boy, you're dating yourself. But we're dated both. Um, I was at the AI lab in uh, SRI at the time all of this was going on. And uh, <clears throat> as you, I recall your visits uh, very well. They were pretty whirlwind visits, as I recall. <laughs> AI lab at SRI. At SRI, we shared the same computer room. I worked on Shaky the Robot, which was right next to the to Doug's lab. I read about Shaky the Robot in Life, but I don't remember seeing it. Oh well, he was right there on the other side of the computer room from where they where we built the 10x and where uh, <clears throat> Doug had his terminal. Uh -huh. you, were, you just want to comment? You talked about his approach to user interfaces, and he certainly did want people to work 
to practice and do all of these things. Uh, he, the analogy that I remember he gave, if you want to play tennis, the only way you'll be any good at it is practice, practice, practice. And I'm a night owl and a software geek, and I worked on NLS. So I came into the lab many times late at night because I had some bright idea, usually at two in the morning. And I would go in, and at the other end of the lab, there was Doug Engelbart practicing for uh. of, with that the five key paddles on the left side. The thumb was an A. The next finger was B. Those two fingers were C. Right. And we were supposed to learn all of that. He well, was the only. In, you're counting in binary. If you know that, it makes yes. Sense. But he's he's the only one that ever got that to work. But he did it by practicing for hours and hours, and late <laughs> late hours in the uh, in the lab. But he, uh, all of your comments, he was a a formal, phenomenal guy. Right. I, well, I cherish the hours I had with him. All of, this, all of this while he, he had a, a family life, and Ballard was wonderful. Yeah. I'll never forget the day I went to lunch with him, and he was very grim because Ballard was in the hospital with cancer, and his mm -hmm. medical benefits had just run out. Yeah. So she was left to die with cancer. We'd all, I'd already stayed in the place many times. Yeah. And she had repaired the, the house after, it had, after the interior had burned. She was great. Yeah. Then his daughters tried to prevent him from marrying uh, Karen because they thought he was she was after his money. Nothing could possibly have been further from the truth. <laughs> Those were interesting times with a bunch of very interesting people. Yes. <laughs> Anyhow, I was just going to say that Engelbart was uh, an engineer's engineer on several grounds. Uh, he did publish a paper fairly early on, which uh, basically articulated uh, very explicitly what became known as Moore's Law. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. he was not the first uh, person to make that observation, but uh, uh, he was uh, in his, his uh, the fact he made it for MOS devices uh, was not widely known. Um, he um, he worked in a lot, large number of different areas and made uh, contributions in each. His uh, publications are interesting at uh, uh, in in many different fields. Um, so uh, he's is a uh, uh, a bit of a Renaissance uh, engineer, I guess, in some sense. And uh, you know he. He, should, he needs to be appreciated. Somebody should bite the bullet and write a biography about, about him, but that hasn't happened yet. Maybe that's uh, something that you might attempt, Ted. <laughs> More big projects are not on the horizon. Okay. Uh, is there any other, are there any other questions here? He, he, yeah. he, he was Norwegian Jewish, which is interesting. The, oh. Engelbart, uh, the Engelbart side. Really? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm sort of a student. It's, it's, I'm sort of a student of wonderful failed software projects, and Xanadu is up there as one of my best examples. With the transputer, maybe. Oh, the transputer, uh, the IBM FS project, which had you know a thousand programmers working on it. But you know, I understand why why systems with a thousand programmers could fail. But somehow, I'm having trouble understanding why a system that is, is supposedly conceptually simpler than something Engelbart was doing, fewer commands, fewer concepts, maybe it had a lot of, you know, certainly um, micropayments is not easy to implement. But, um, you know, why, aside from Roger and Mark uh, not getting along or not working well together. Why did that project drag on for so long and then eventually it, it well, was it, decided it, to have failed? The, it, it, it was owned by Autodesk and the name was owned by Autodesk. So after, after Roger's system, after, after I demoted Roger, instead of Mark 
trying to finish what Roger had started, he began all over again using a hyper an, an extremely intricate system for automatic uh, version management devised by Eric Drexler called the Int, hmm. which is very hard to find documented. And so Mark was programming simultaneously in small talk and then transferring the small talk to C++ while he was implementing the int. And he did this for four years until the web took over and Autodesk killed the project. Meanwhile, uh, Autodesk, didn't they have a, a uh, micropayment system and an electronic market that they had invested in, which they killed after a few years? Yes, that, 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 that broke off the Xanadu project, I believe. And uh, an auction system and, you know, everything that could have been eBay that turned into eBay, mm -hmm. they had and then they squandered it. There is probably a book there along with Fumbling the Future about the failures of Autodesk. Could well be. I am not one to criticize. But that was that was after John Walker had left Autodesk, I think. Right. And Carol Bartz was the, the new president, I think. Yeah. I think that I wouldn't say that Xanadu uh, was a failed project. It was unsuccessful, but it produced a large number of extremely interesting ideas, a number of uh, uh, things, things which have uh, since later made their way into more general use. And so... Uh, yeah, but I mean, if you'd had a VP of reality that told <laughs> Mark, don't do that. <laughs> right? You don't have to boil the ocean in order to write the first line of code. <laughs> then maybe, maybe it would be on GitHub today and there would be a thousand people working on it. <laughs> it might be that. But I think also the, the other thing, Mark, is that, that the Xanadu project uh, really did differ from, from the Augment project. The Augment project had lots of little pieces that fit together. Whereas the Xanadu project had lots of pieces of data that were supposed to fit together dynamically. Yes, it was. It was that's a, a much more difficult problem. Well, there was another difference, which is Augment had a real customer, which was the DARPA Network Information Center. All of those documents that Jake Feinler edited were written on NLS, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. And so. They so were, did Jake? Did Jake know all those commands, or enough to edit the documents? I, guess. I think there was a base, you know, set of commands that you needed in order to compose documents, and you know, you didn't need to know all of the all of the eighty or hundred commands more than C system, more than Unix system calls. I think. Mm -hmm. By the way, I said I have to get off at five, but I don't have to get it off till my next. Appointment arrives, and that could be another hour. <laughs> so, uh, I, Liz, you know, uh, what what happened is, is zigzag. You were working on the last uh, time. Oh yes, I'm very proud of that. Uh, it's stalled. I'm I'm not proud of my behavior toward my collaborators. I betrayed them, and I feel very ashamed of that because I said my patent would 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 forbid its being distributed in the United States, and that was really stupid of me. In any case, it works best on Windows XP. So if you, you, you can watch it on YouTube, and you can then buy a used Windows XP system on eBay on which to run it. Can, well, two, two things. Uh, is there any analogous system in any other place like zig, what you intended with zigzag. No, I, zigzag is based upon a mathematical construct, which is cells connected <clears throat> in as many dimensions as you like. The only restriction being that the positive side 
of one cell connects to the, neg the corresponding negative cell uh, uh, side of another cell in that particular dimension. So you can tie up in knots or create, you could create a regular spreadsheet with it if you wanted. But if you look at the zigzag movies on YouTube, you see some extremely interesting things done by, uh, especially by Adam Moore. He, so he, uh, a multi-dimensional uh, graph is... Yes. Uh, yes. Well, not exactly a multi-dimensional graph because the, the notion of a dimension there implies a uniform space. Whereas the dimension in zigzag are, is stepping stones that can be configured any which way in a given dimension. So uh, extra-dimensional so, space or hyper-dimensional, perhaps. Well, I call it hyperthogonal. The, yeah, there, the, but there is no overarching set of dimensions. Well, there's certainly not a center. There's not a center and there's not a space. Except unless you unless you call the construction of cells a space, would the user be considered the center? One would well that's that's a, that's a, you're playing with words there. <laughs> the user has in the two in the versions you can see the user has two cur two cursors, one for each hand. <clears throat> And they may be operated independently in different dimensions. So they can walk around, they can join each other, they can meet up and both be on the same cell, or they can wander all over the lot and connect things from all over. It's, it's, it's truly a fascinating and amazing space. I just wish that... Uh, is, is there something that could be resurrected from it? It exists. It doesn't need to be re re resurrected. You can download it from xanadu.com slash zigzag and run it on a, on a uh, Windows XP machine with, of course, the appropriate Java. <laughs> There's a link in the chat, which will get you there. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So I have one small question. Good. It better be small because my next appointment is just arriving. And when do you want to do this again? <laughs> Will you uh, be interested in chatting about this? I think that just talking about the the past history and your perceptions uh, is very interesting, and perhaps we can do it again another time. Well, that, would, that I think that's a nice idea. Okay, cool. But I think about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll we'll, we'll negotiate. Thank you very much, Ted. Okay, Thank you, everybody, for participating. And uh, uh, with this, we'll close. Thank you. Bye-bye.